Freeland. How many of you think you have a good memory? And how many of you consider yourselves creative? I'm an artist and today I'll be talking about my artistic journey and how it can impact you and how you remember. The visuals that you will see in my slide presentation are examples of some of my art, many from my book, A Place for Memory Where Art and Science Meet. It began the 90s when I was um, commissioned to design the Memorial Room for Holocaust Museum Houston, Texas, <clears throat> I became aware of the need to look at memory in many different ways. I designed it with art that welcomed people in to feel the emotions of remembrance, sorrow, and to reach hope. And through a broken triptych, the central wall of tears, flanked by the left wall of remembrance, which is dark and fractured, and on the right, flanked by the wall of hope, earth to green with a progression of menorah-like trees. I then realized the power of art in creating public memorials. I then discovered afterwards, I was in the midst of a quiet revolution in the world of neuroscience. New imaging technologies were enabling scientists to start mapping the human brain. Memory, in all its mystery, compelled me to explore it further through science. I then proceeded to um, propose and receive the commission to design the Millennial Exhibition for the University City Science Center's Art and Science Series, Esther Klein Gallery, which is in Philadelphia. And I um, proposed, um, which would be appropriate looking back on the 20th century, the subject would be memory. I worked with a neuropsychologist for a year, and I was really surprised to find that the neurobiological elements of constructing memory were quite similar to the elements of being creative. For me, this was a revelatory experience because it meant that we were all creators through the lens of memory. So I went on to design my installation with that in mind and to make multiple paths to take through art. I used samples of my imagery, my art, and poetry, and wove them together. Um, I also turned it into a teaching site, and I ended up teaching to numerous groups of all ages and disciplines, and ended with a forum inviting diverse professionals from all over the city for the topic of weaving education, memory, creativity, and learning. And it got tagged. Memory Connections Matter got tagged in the course of its three-month run to be a metaphoric walk through the brain illuminating the connections and relationships between memory, creativity, brain function, and learning. In this particular slide, you see this very bright panel, this bright yellow panel on the right. And it was the first piece that I did working with the neuropsychologist. I ended up writing this poem. I brought it to her. Um, we met once a month for a year, and I said, I, you know, I thought I was going to bring some sketches, but this is what I came up with. And she read it, and she said, it's a perfect definition of memory. So I was surprised, I think she was surprised, but then I had this great idea that I would make it the gateway to my um, exhibition. And instead of having this descriptive paragraph that you might be familiar with before you enter an exhibition, I thought what better is as a piece of work, um, piece of art, and so I of course enlarged the scale, made it very bright, so it would capture people's attention before they went into the site itself. And the essence of this poem is what I first learned was that memory is subjective. And so some of the lines is that memory is subjective and is subject to multiple interpretations. And it proceeds to kind of elaborate. I used, this is the first piece also where I wove visual and verbal metaphor together, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, so on the floor, you'll also see these brightly colored patterns. And these are rubber pieces that I also um, set up to kind of mimic the network of memory itself, the um, neuronal pathways and the passing of signals in our brain. And uh, then you see just a glimpse, which is that I'll show a close-up. These pathways started to end in three-dimensional stations. This one is memory and place, and this is one of four three-dimensional stations that I designed for the site. Um, the others were memory and emotion, memory and neurobiology, and memory and our senses. And as you can see, there's a lot of papers there. Those were not you know, created by me. I designed the site to be interactive. And so the stations themselves were rendered very differently, um, compelling people, gallery visitors, to actually have to make a decision once they entered into the gallery itself where to go. 
um, and I uh, talked about it when I taught in the site, about that's, that's how we process memory and how we make memory, the decisions of where we go and um, what direction to take. This, um, uh, so what you're seeing, I invited people to then stop, sit, pause, take in art, um, and actually leave something behind. And many people left written and drawn memories behind. We collected them on a daily basis. And it then turned my site into an active site, interactive site. And at the end of it, it was great because I had a whole repository of people's memories. An early metaphor for how I wanted to move people through um, the installation was I kept thinking about a train station. And at the time, I was taking the train a lot. And I remember standing on a platform waiting for a train and having this feeling of you know, movement, non-movement, you're all watching all these people arrive and depart, you're kind of suspended between two points. And every time I started thinking about it, it kept you know, going back to what I was learning about how memory works and how we make memory. So I decided that would be a very um, interesting metaphor, and I even uh, wove in, and this is a sample, the train image itself, um, and that I, again, talked about when I taught in the site. And, and you're waiting on the platform, and you're waiting to move forward yet away, and you're conjuring the questions, um, where am I going, what am I leaving, and what do I want to take with me? Afterwards, Memory Connections Matter traveled and became the central focus for an educational conference called Fields of Mind, and it proceeded to also be the subject in many conferences for, for um, years. But I also was always a very curious person and always wanted to kind of push the envelope about um, how more and how much more can we actually do with art. And a friend of mine suggested that one and I think about um, turning the installation into a book. So I love that idea. And the book is a place for memory where art and science meet. <clears throat> and um, so I started to work on it and it was a great design challenge. I also write, so it was a perfect blend of different things that I had been involved with. Uh, and then unfortunately, or, or fortunately, uh, which I thought was going to be, you know, a couple of years of working. It ended up taking me eight years. But well worth it. Um, the book itself ended up being definitely a retranslation of Memory Connections Matter, but as a book. And so I had this opportunity, instead of having, having this um, three-dimensional site that you would walk through and have um, responses, that one of the ideas of the book, obviously, is, you, t you know, you turn pages. So each page turned, um, triggers memory, change perception and enables you to at least reflect and make new connections. I designed the book to be primarily visual as well as um, just like the site itself, you can open the book anywhere and find meaning. But you can also, if you happen to be a linear reader, you can open up and, and you know, start with page one and it, it's all set up that way, which is also one of the reasons it took so long to make. So <clears throat> my next um, section, since I took so long, I kept thinking about these, these um, ideas about memory. What is memory? What role does it play in who we are? I asked you in the very beginning, the first question when I came out here, how many of you think you have a good memory? So it could obviously conjures the question, what is it then? And, and memories are not as objective as we think they are. Our memory is quite malleable, and we're continually shaping it each day. So our thoughts and our feelings and our past experiences become the threads you weave. The photographs in a scrapbook that you do the stories and poems that you listen to help give shape to memory. Memory is a recollection modified by daily, continuous daily input. Memory is a reconstruction of separate pieces. History is written from someone's perspective. Memory works much the same way, only you are the author. All the remembering returns, associations falling from afar. As I discovered, Associations, making personal associations, is really important to the making of memory. And this is my slide about my connection then to memory, as I said in the beginning, to creativity. So memory is a portal to creativity, memory's imprint. The second question I asked you is, do you consider yourselves creative? And perhaps you do, but I'm sure you know at least somebody that you know, swears or not. Um, I believe uh, that everybody is creative. Um, we use it every day, so your thoughts again, your feelings, um, the way you process, you're engaging your innate creativity. So some of, these peop some of this idea that some people are outside the box thinkers, it's, I, again, we're all, we all have that capacity. And why is this important? Because creativity is what innovation hinges on. <clears throat> 
It's that reordering and rearranging of ideas and forging them into new relationships. Understanding this concept of creativity as an innate human capacity that we have means that we have it. And so the next steps really are learning how to use it and to enhance it. And that's where the arts can play a central role. Memory and our senses. So our senses, we're multisensory, um, our senses for the vision, hearing, smell, taste, and touch um, help us interpret the world ever since we're, we're born. And through a continually growing neuronal network of pathways, it's, it's constantly moving for us. And so I've titled this memory as a multisensory adventure. When we were young, if you remember, we wondered and we asked why. And then we got busy translating these sensory messages into useful information. And it is something that we can consider now that we have this capacity and in ways how we can kind of start to add that to our lives and, and in learning. So memory learning transformation, that <clears throat> wonder of being human, that wonder of looking and listening, that creative power unravels in the making of memory. The first time I started thinking about different artistic ideas about being sensory, I read Marcel Proust and Remembrance of Things Past. His cookie, his Madeleine, transported us back, and it was his literary creation that connected smell and taste to memory, left a huge impression on me. And afterwards, I was um, presenting the book to different uh, audiences, Again, I was pushing the envelope and thinking, how can I um, discuss this and engage more people? And so from those combinations of things, I discovered that I would like to start in a public event. And so the pictures you see are um, samples from an event I titled Cookie Remember, Memory Potluck Suppers. And I invited people, all people, people, many people I didn't even know, um, to come and bring a dish with a significant memory story. And <clears throat> since food connects us all, diversity of flavors suggests where we come from. It was a very powerful evening. So as we have this potential to look at memory and learn something about ourselves, we can also find connections with others. And that is exactly what happened during these um, potluck suppers. Expanding on our senses, we have music, we have sound, which can be very transformative, and they're very important in the formation of memories. <clears throat> so you can think about perhaps a certain piece of music that brings a certain emotion or a certain kind of a familiarity. Those are all things that help us remember and also connect, which I will talk about soon, to our, some things about our emotional state. Motion. So how can our moods alter our memories? And the idea is that how you feel about something when an event occurs can become the context for how you remember it. And then we can connect these things to a picture, to a piece of music. You can probably put, start putting that together. And it's very, you know, an important idea. I've tagged it the me file. And that me file means this highly personal lens of shared events by two people can't be remembered the same because we don't share the same sets of emotions with past experiences. So a memory, a recollection can be changed just by the mood that you presently have and vice versa. So they're very interconnected and I, I find that you know, fascinating and it certainly helped me actually look at certain relationships, personal relationships and work relationships through this, through this particular lens. And then there's memory in place. And um, if you remember, I talked about the three-dimensional stations that I constructed and designed for Memory Connections Matter. And the one I showed you was actually memory in place, and there were four of them. And that was a big surprise to my science advisor because it had the most responses of all four stations. People left stories, poems, quotations, sketches. It was quite a beautiful experience. And most of them talked about a connection to their childhood home or a significant location when they were young. And 
you might have that experience. Along the way, as this, the um, site was up for a while, I started to be moved by it, because I said we collected these daily, and I started reading them, and I started forming, actually, a book of people's memories and also separate poetry, as I started to be very curious about what do poets and writers, are they using place, childhood home, as much as some of the gallery visitors? And I did. I kept finding um, examples of that, so I thought that was really interesting. And in terms of memory and place as well, what do we have? The Caves of Lascaux, Pompeii, Easter Island, to name a few. These tell a unique story and contain memories of past cultures, which is, which is huge for us, just to get a glimpse into the past and through place. Now, this is my piece of memory and patterns. And along the way, we've, I'm telling you that making connections, make per, making personal associations is really important to creating memory. But what is our brain? What are we doing with all of that? Well, we form patterns, patterns of incoming information. So in my book, as I, as I did in my site, <clears throat> I create from nature. I use um, imagery from nature, the organic and the geometric. And in this sample, I pulled out some samples, and they are repeated in variations throughout my book, which I'll talk about in a minute. But there's references definitely to branching and jumping, wheels turning, pulsing neuronal signals, steps, blocks. I, I just kept going with it. The more you can use your imagination, the more you, know, you can look at variation. And in art, so in a visual language, which I will stress, we, we actually are able to delve into um, changing these patterns through just using lots of different lines, shapes, colors, textures, and value. Um, and then you can just keep altering a little bit and your pattern itself shifts and changes. And this is quite metaphoric and quite similar to the working of memory and how we make memory because no sooner do we do a, one little thing, um, it changes our memory. So that's an important thing. So, we, so as you go through the book, you will encounter um, uh, different ideas about repetition, so that would be one thing about memorizing. That's something that we do when we're really young, to memorize something as our first grasp on um, using our memory, and we don't have any more complex cognitive behavioral um, capacity at that point, so we, we memorize. Um, but as we grow, we're able to kind of expand upon that. Um, and visual language, which is primarily, you know, my domain, um, there's, there's a quite depth of experience, um, especially because we live in such a visual world. Memory connects us to a larger pur purpose, relationships, and in the book I say, the gift of connectedness. And this became quite apparent to me as I was going along, and of course it was many years of building up this work, thinking about patterns as an artist, patterns that are involved in our neuronal pathways and the passing of signals and how we make memory. But I thought in life, really what's most important are our relationships, whether they're our family relationships, our friends, or in the workplace. I'm also an educator, my students, you know, they're very significant, and perhaps they're the most important. And so I thought that's the connectedness. So things are interconnected, but that's really important. So that kind of pattern making. And what drives all of this is imagination. Imagination moves us forward. We are constantly reactivating our imagination as we weave our personal stories together. And here you see what I was talking about a little, I've combined my image of the train with some of my geometric patterns and made a composite. I like to think of connections as moments, and one can be transformed by this. So when I found this wonderful arched tree, I knew I had captured a moment. And now just for a moment, I'd like you to close your eyes and think how little we actually live in the present. We're so caught with thinking about the past and planning for the future. So for this moment, just be here, think about the present. And now, please open your eyes so you can. Uh, in my book, after a year of research and working, and then years of constructing and thinking about what to put in and what not, um, I decided to dedicate the book to everyone. As I found out, memory becomes us. And visually, just to see this visual metaphor is the um, image on the left. It's the same image, but I've changed it. So the one on the left is really when we're struggling to recollect something, and perhaps the image is a little blurry, so I rendered it atmospherically. And on the right, as we work at trying to um, remember, um, perhaps an image moves forward. It gets to have more clarity, so I made it focused, I made it have bright colors and patterns and to, to create this kind of contrast and be a metaphor for the working of memory.
<clears throat> I make art to create a sense of order, meaning, and beauty to transcend the everyday. And this has been a way of life for me since the time I can remember. These are a couple of samples of digital prints that I alter from my drawings, paintings, photography, and poetry. <clears throat> I use metaphoric um, relationships between memory and neurological activity and pattern making and recognition. They make, these compositions make connections. I become a sensory observatory, interpretive and suggestive. Now in the 21st century, Art and science have never been closer. We've got this imaging technology that's enabling scientists to map the human brain and find out how the brain learns. And it gives us a vast array of visuals to interpret artistically and creatively without a scientific idea that has, in the past, has presided over a century and defines us. How we navigate in these rich perceptual fields for me, is very exciting to contemplate. We do this daily, and we're sharing this information globally. We need the arts. We need art to help us form relationships and learn more about how making those connections, to learn about observation, self-expression, and the human spirit. How our human brain learns to remember, works to remember, forms a new blueprint for learning and a new lens for human creativity. Before I leave, I'd like to ha leave you with a question before you go on your personal journeys. How does memory and its relationship to creativity guide me along the way? Thank you very much. <laughs>